Good morning, good day to everyone. Today is uh, Yudzai and Tamos, Shivos and Tamos. It begins the three weeks, the hardest time for us uh, Jewish people. It's the morning period and uh, an intense uh, three weeks. And as usual, Hasidus uh, has an interesting way to deal with it and look at it. Uh, of course, not to Chas v'sholem, exclude halacha and uh, all of the details that are obligatory uh, halachically, but uh, the attitude and the mindset that Hasidus offers can be very uh, rich and helpful when you have to deal with uh, a morning situation. <clears throat> it reminds me when um, uh, there was a, 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 do- a girl, uh, her, her mother of a family, her, she was the oldest of the family, her mother passed on, I think in the late 70s, and she was uh, very distraught, and she wrote to the Rebbe a letter saying, here she is, the oldest daughter, she now has to function like a mother to the younger siblings, and they had lots of children, quite a few children, and um, and she was, you know, the, the letter was a very, very tearful morning type of a letter, and it was, you know, written to the Rebbe sometime during the year, not, at, not in the very beginning. And the Rebbe answers her in a full-page letter in English, and the, 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 what I remember from the letter is that Eber says, um, just as uh, not mourning at all is not proper, mourning too much is also not proper. Now, of course, this is has to be this. It's a blanket statement, and it needs to be you know thought about and discussed with a rabbi and a shpia and you know a, a good friend. What that means exactly. Because uh, we're, we're not talking now about halachically, but the, what the Rebbe said in that letter was that, you know, Hashem gives us periods of mourning because those periods are the exact and precise amount of time that we need to get over a particular mourning stage. So the Rebbe said that there's the first three days, and then there's the seven days, and then there's the 30 days, and then there's the 12 months. Each of these four periods is a certain stage in the morning period. And of course, the most intense is the first three days, and the next seven days, the next uh, amount of days to, to seven, and then the 30 days. It gets less and less, although one still is in mourning. It doesn't mean that six months down the road you're not mourning. You are mourning, but the intensity and the response to the mourning, what, what, what halacha is dictating is that it, it it shouldn't be that way. Now, of course, you know, when it comes to feelings of the heart, it should or it shouldn't really doesn't apply. If someone has got a bit ill or someone feels elated, then uh, like the Alter Rebbe says in the Geras HaKodesh regarding giving tzedakah, what's the halacha? You're, not, you're supposed to give uh, 10%. And the Gemara says when it comes to 20%, al yuvazvev, al yuvazvev, Yes, sir. Twenty percent. You shouldn't give him more than twenty percent. So, if someone wants to give thirty percent. Is he allowed to? According to according to the halacha, he's not allowed to. The halacha never says halacha. We mean you're not allowed to. But when it comes to being well and more ill, you can't say a person you're not allowed to if he needs this for the illness. If he needs a certain amount of medicine. You take whatever that amount is. So spiritually too, if you give, by giving uh, more than twenty percent, it's a spiritual remedy for the particular ailment that you're in. Then, then you should, then you should, then you should, uh, then you're allowed to. So this, this is something that uh, that he says over there. So the same thing here. When we say that there's morning periods, it's true. Oh, as a generality, it's true. But if someone if someone is is uh, feeling that they they need this to for their uh, mental health for their spirit for the spiritual health when it comes to spirituality the rule doesn't apply but otherwise other than that other than the spirituality situation the rule does apply so just as the Rebbe told this uh, this girl this teenager that um, she's mourning too much 
and she has to get on with her life and she has to be an example for her younger siblings, we apply this too to our situation. Now our situation, when it comes to three weeks, in a way, in a way, even if you're living in Eretz Yisrael, and even if you're living in the old city, and you're living, yeah, okay, so you could see the walls of Yerushalayim. You could see, you know, more of the memorabilia. But, but the fact is that it's 2,000 years. It's so, it's so long ago that, that it's kind of uh, foreign to us. Yes, and I said yesterday that under each chuppah would break a glass, and it's all true. But nevertheless, what we encounter daily in daily life is much more real to the average person. So, A, the question is, you know, how is it that we, we bring in a mourning period into our lives? Because when Halacha says that these three weeks, the morning period, it means that this, these three weeks, you are to feel this way. It's not just a, not about, you know, showering during the nine days and doing this and doing that and, and not taking haircuts and not listening to music. Those are all technicalities to help us feel a certain way. So in other words, what's the objective, Moshe, of these three weeks? The objective seems to be to um, to um, the objective is to to feel sad. So you have to ask yourself a question: What's the what's the psychological Torah view on making yourself feel sad? What benefit will there be from feeling sad? That's one question. Next issue is, like the Rebbe says, don't feel too sad. Because if you feel too sad, you won't be able to function. So the second question is, what's considered too sad and what's not considered too sad? What is the overall purpose of feeling sad when I can feel happy? So that, that's what I want to explore today, Al Pi Chasidis, these three ideas. It's a, really one idea. <clears throat> but I, I hope I you know clarified where I'm coming from, where Chasidis is coming from on the overall issue. Because we don't tend to think this way. We just tend to think, oh, I can't, uh, uh, no more haircuts, no more swimming, no more this, whatever, whatever the halakhas are for the three weeks and the nine days. So the Rebbe introduced I think it was in the 80s, maybe the late 70s, I forget now. He introduced an idea that on each fast day, it used to be the custom going way back that the rabbi, the rav of the shul, or the magid of the community would say, divrei kivushin. Kivushin means words of comfort. Sometime during the 24 hour period, the leader of the community of the congregation would, get, would sermonize. And the sermonizing was for the purpose of comforting people. So what we understand from this is that the purpose was not to berate the people. It was not to scold the people and say, you better do tshuva. If not, you're going to burn and, 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 you know, and all that. That, you know, was the style of the Magidim. You heard of a Magid, the Magidim. The preachers, we call that preachers, where they would come into a city and they would literally be in the shul and they would so berate the, the crowd and the crowd was sincere and they cried and he made people cry. And this was a style used in Europe in certain communities in particular and it was called Magidus, preaching. I recall, parenthetically, I recall in the mid-70s here in Borough Park, when Rabbi Sholem Shvadran, you must have heard of him, they call him the Magid of Yerushalayim, I think. So he was in town. And someone said, or I saw a poster, that the Magid of Jerusalem, of Yerushalayim, is going to 
speak. So, you know, that caught my attention. I had never really heard a Magid. You know, we, we don't have here today Magidim. So I thought this is going to be really a, uh, a wash machine experience. I'm going to get all washed out and it's going to be great for my, for my ego, a real true experience. The place, it was at the Beis Yaakov on 46th Street and 14th Avenue, I remember. And the place was packed. And he definitely was entertaining, very entertaining. But I didn't walk out crying, and nor did I see anyone crying. So the Magidus, the Magidus has also changed post-Holocaust, where, you know, the Magid, either he himself doesn't have the craft and ability to do it, or he does, but he chooses not to. Nevertheless, what I'm saying is that Divrik Fushin Avi, that the Rebbe alluded, uh, spoke about, that they used to do way back, is not Magidus, it's not preaching. It's a, a sermon, you can call it a sermon of sorts, with the purpose is Kivushin, to comfort. The orientation was very different. So that's an important thing to understand. And the Rebbe then said, we need to bring this back to our communities. And the Rebbe himself showed an example. Until then, on a fast day, any fast day, the Rebbe never spoke. You know, it was a regular fast day. You davened, you know, you davened and, and you fasted. But from that time on, when he spoke about this uh, old minute that has been forgotten and lost and not done, and he, and he started to implement it, implement it, Every single fast day, we knew there's going to be a talk after Mincha. Rebbe would daven normally Mincha 3.15 in the afternoon. So although there were only a few hours left, whether it be in the winter, whether it be in the summer, you know, the bulk of the day has gone, but the Rebbe spoke. And sometimes he could speak for a half an hour to an hour, 45 minutes, a long, a long sermon, a long talk, a long sicha, its purpose being Kavushin. So, one of these uh, talks that the Rebbe gave on Shiva Sorry, Osir, no. yes? Sorry, just a quick question. So, the Rebbe, he would, on these days, let's say like a day like today, Shiva Thomas, he would daven, the Rebbe would daven Mincha like 3.15. Yeah. What time would he speak? Uh, we finished, yeah, three satira, let's say a quarter to four, 20 to four. It was a regular daven with three satira, right? By Yechal. And mm -hmm. after Elena, after the whole day, everyone stayed in their place. And he stayed on his team and he turned around, instead of facing the wall, he turned around at a podium, they put a mic there, and he spoke. And, and what happened after he spoke? <laughs> everyone went home to, to their merry ways, and hopefully they thought about what he said, and they did something about it. The, 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 the point, I mean, the, the, the Rebbe didn't speak, like, close to the end of the song. It's no. No, it was all. It was it was always or most of the time after mincha, and mincha was always three fifteen. He kept he kept saying it. the reason mincha was three fifteen was because of the yeshiva, the bacharim, seven seventy bacharim. Two twenty is the end of the first seder in the yeshiva, right? Three thirty officially begins the second seder, so the bacharim have to go to eat. Get, take a breather, and by 3.15, they were back, they were able to daven mincha, and then 3.30, they went right to learn. That, that was the idea why, I think, I think, why he kept it at 3.15. The reason for the morning, I read recently, why did he start 10 o'clock? This is a question I'm sure that uh, people, have, you've asked, people have asked you, why does Chabad start so late daven, right? And the, Rebbe, the reason is because the Free the Rebbe started at 10 o'clock. Believe me, the Rebbe was up much earlier and he could have davened earlier, but he was so committed to his father-in-law. And, and now you're going to say, you're going to ask a question, now, why did the previous Rebbe start 10 o'clock? So a layman's answer would be is because of his health. He came to America, he wasn't a well man, and you know, until he got up, until he got prepared, or whether he, even he was up, whatever it was, it seemed like it took it took a while for him to to calm himself and get to himself. And some days it was harder. So I think at ten o'clock was a a time again that that he was ready at the time. And the Rebbe 
took that and he said, if that's the case, we're starting at 10. You know, and if there's a better answer, fine. That's as far as I know, and I, I recently did find. But that, of course, means you have to say Krishna before and um, try to finish uh, Shmonesra, you know, before his mantra, you know. Anyway, that's another discussion. I, I don't want to go into that now. But I do want to say that Chabad Lubavitch is not lightheaded about Mantfilos on Krishna. That's a fallacy that some have, you know, accused Lubavitch of. And, and sometimes it definitely seems that way. And I'm not going to, you know, lie to you and, and, and be foolish. It absolutely. And some people do, do, you know, they get up late and the name of being the Chassid and davening the long, they, they just daven into the afternoon and they miss this Mantfila. You know, if you're davening earlier and you have kavana and, you, and you're so involved and it goes over the monfilus, the rabbi has letters um, saying that that's, if you start with the minion and you daven that way, it's acceptable. But the preferred way is to, of course, to do this monfilus. So it's important to know that because this is a question that people ask. Dolphin, when you say monfilus, though, you're talking about as in Davin and Shachris by Chatzot, by Chatzot, so you're talking about Davin and Shachris by, you know, the fourth hour. The fourth because, hour, the fourth hour, okay. the, the fourth hour is the preferred way. So I, right, I mean, I'm just, okay. Whatever Halacha says, Chatzot, Chatzot is already, I think, a, a secondary time. Right, right. No, no, that, that, that's what I'm asking. I don't mean to, I don't mean to sidetrack us. I'm only asking because because it's true. We all get. I mean, I don't know about the Avi. I don't know about Moshe. But I get asked this all the time, right? And so the problem is that if you start at ten o'clock, there's no way you're going to make the fourth hour. You're not going to make Sman Tfila. Right. Know, uh, okay. So the answer is, why do we start davening ten o'clock? Because you should have been up at seven o'clock learning Chassidus for two three hours. <laughs> Hundred percent. That's, that's and, what and I you mean. know and 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 absolutely. If you didn't do that, then our school here in Borough Park starts nine thirty, and we're finished eleven thirty. Uh, I would say that at least probably three quarters of the year, we, you, those that want to make some Montreal, I, you know, um, close to yeah, it. That, that's because okay, but the, it, in New York, because of the way the time zone is. It's probably easier to do that than here in here in, 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 right, than here in here. Right, so. right. Okay, let's go back to what we're discussing. So anyway, so that's what the rep so so I want to share with you uh, a general thought that the Rebbe shared on today's day about you Zion Thomas, Shibasa Thomas, what it means, and hopefully this will answer some of our questions. Today, five things happened, and we'll focus on one of the five happened in our history. And the, the, the thing that probably is most known, some of the others are not so known, but the Shulchanar does mention five things happened. And according to the Shalmi, even the sixth thing happened. So the, it's Hufku Ha'ir, Hufka Ha'ir. The city walls were, were breached. Uh, the enemy were able to make a hole, a dent in the wall and get in. You, a sort of a tabus, you know, what, 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 what did the enemy do? Samach Malach Babu, they surrounded the walls. But today, not only were they uh, surrounding the walls, they hufka. And then on Tisha B'av, they destroyed, they burnt the base what is this? What is the idea of hufka here? So the Gemara says, it's a Gemara, the Gemara says, Chayma Zutayra, the wall, the wall, the walls of Yerushalayim represent the Taira. Why do, do the walls, the Chaima, represent the Taira? Because uh, what does a Chaima do, Avi? A Chaima, a large, tall wall, it protects, it protects from the enemy coming in. And you, know, and you put up a tower and you're able to see. So the wall is a protective measure to protect the city. So too, the learning of Taira is a protection for the Jewish people. When you learn Taita, when you learn Taita, Taita protects you from many, many problems and issues. Why? Because Taita tells you what's proper and what's not proper. So if you learn and you understand and you study and you then follow what the Taita says, you're more protected. 
just as if you have a better and taller and stronger wall, you're more protected from the enemy. What happened? The wall was breached. The Torah was breached. You allowed a hole to be made in Torah. What does that mean? That means that you are you allow a, a, a compromise. It might be a little hole in the wall, a little compromise. But that is the beginning of a large, a lar a large, a large um, hole, which gets worse and worse and worse, and leads ultimately three weeks later to a destruction of the base amikdash. And the Rebbe explains in the sikhs, in the Libri Kvushim, in the words of comfort of, on Shivas and Tammuz, how important it is to realize this at the beginning, the first of the three weeks today, that letting a little hole get through the wall can lead to a full destruction of the wall, and which happened. So too with Taita. If you make a compromise in the Taita, even the iota of a compromise, it ends up in it ends up being no good. This was his overall message as far as the problem, the issue. And then Rebbe spoke about the, the safeguard and the remedy for this problem is to not allow a compromise. In the early 1950s, there were individuals who in the name of Taira, started doing Kiruv outreach. And some of them had written to the Rebbe, they had a relationship with the Rebbe. And the Rebbe got wind, he was told that they are, they're allowing men and women together, Taruvas, some are listening, singing to, to groups, and then women sing as well, which is Koyalisha. And there were such issues that were happening. And I, I want to make it clear because people think it was only happening in Camp Ramai in Chicago or New York. You know, it was only happening in, in you know, in, in, in modern Orthodox or conservative institutions. You know, here in the Catskills, I don't know if, if you guys know, maybe Avi knows, there, there were there were hotels, you know, those days, the heyday, Grossinger's, the, the Highview, Pioneer Hotel, I mean, the Catskill, the Borschfeld, this was like, I mean, you, you know, the Hasidic, Neville. what? Was there one called Neville? Neville, Neville, yeah, Neville, yeah, Neville, all of those. Who frequented most of these places? No, 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 not most of these places. Everyone here, which was a, which was from and not from, and I know I know one of the owners. You know, he, he comes from Vision to Hasidim, and I'm talking to him. I can hear like you know the Tznias wasn't great, and they were from, but the whole you know the culture in 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 the in the Catskills in the summer, it wasn't maybe as bad as Venice Beach in California, or you know Florida, but it wasn't it wasn't great. I recall. When the Rebbe, you know, the Rebbe was against going on these vacations. He really was. And, but he wasn't against it, like, you know, because you're going to do a sin. He didn't really, he just said, like, you know, you're going to have a vacation, and then you'll need a vacation when you come back, because he's so knocked out from schlepping and driving and, 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 and all the stuff. And in those days, please understand, we just still, people didn't have houses. Today, people have nice, luxurious houses. But, you know, I went one time, I'm here 23 years. There was one time I went for four weeks when my children were young. I, I said, I, I mean, when I was a boy, my parents took me to, to, to the bungalow several years, but I forgot it, you know, I, I, I left that world. So when I came back here, one time I took the, the, the children, the family there. And after those four weeks, I made myself a promise. Until I have a house there, which I don't, I'm not returning. Because the schmutz and, and the noise <laughs> it was so not a vacation. It was it, it was it was total not a vacation. At least not for me. So the Rebbe spoke about this, and he was sarcastic. And when he would laugh at his own Hasidim, 
who during the summer, they would run to the country. So the Rebbe wasn't a, a, a proponent of, uh, you know, running to the country. But nevertheless, the, the Catskills was full of these people. And uh, there was a breakdown. And that's my point. It wasn't just by the non-religious people. It was by the Frum people, too. And the excuse was, you know, we need some respite and we need better air. And, and so the Rebbe, during the 1950s, there were certain topics that he spoke a lot about from 50 to 60. If you look into his talks, if you ever have the time, and you flip through pages, you'll see that there were certain top. For example, one of the topics he spoke a lot about was about tachlis. You know what tachlis means? What's the bottom line? Because the yeshiva bacharim and their parents, more their parents, were saying, what's the bottom line of sitting in yeshiva when you're 19, 20, 21, 22? Get a life. Go to college, go out to work, make a mensch out of yourself, prepare yourself. What are you sitting in Yiddish does the expression, fetching a bank, pressing the, the bench? And the Rebbe spoke a lot against this attitude, and, and it was called tachlis. In other words, this cheshbet, this thinking of what's the tachlis, what will I have from sitting in yeshiva, the Rebbe said, comes from the klipa. It doesn't come from kedusha. A person needs to learn and fill himself up with Taira, and today it needs to be till 21, to 22, 23, I'm talking about the 1950s. And the Rebbe, and like other Rebbe's and other Rosh Hashiva, were all pushing Bacharim to stay, stay in Yeshiva. And this was a very big push, and it took a lot of energy, and I, I, I think we could say, overall, they were Matzliach in, in, in accomplishing this. That was one topic. <clears throat> Another topic, the Rebbe spoke about was the Hollywood kitchens and, and wall-to-wall carpets. You can, you can hear it. As, he, he used to be sarcastic and laugh about people that spend so much money because they must have wall-to-wall carpets or a Hollywood kitchen. So he was sarcastic about it. And his point being is, like, you're putting yourself into chayvis, into debt, so that you, you should have. And, and, and then he would say, and you're going to tell me the excuse is your wife. You yourself would not have wall to wall carpet. You wouldn't pen spend the money on that. But it's because of your wife, the Rebbe said, Yeah, are you really being truthful? Or do you also appreciate the wall to wall carpet? So, you know, okay, maybe your wife is giving, is giving you more. I, I, I can hear that, I can see it. But nevertheless, if, if, if it's not the, if, if it's causing financial hardships, don't do it. And that was, by the way, a general sheet that the Rebbe's were coming to him in America. He told my own father-in-law when he asked him once, could he come from Australia? So he said, use the money for tzedakah. And he, did, and he didn't allow him to come. The next year, my father-in-law was smart. So before he asked the Rebbe, he gave the equivalent amount of a ticket to tzedakah. And then he told the Rebbe that. And then the Rebbe said, you can come. But these things were going on all these years. So what, what, what am I getting at? Getting at is that that um, the Hufku Ayir, oh, so the Rebbe, a third topic, so I, I mentioned two things we spoke about a lot in the 1950s. A third thing was compromise. And this was because in the name of Taita, people were making compromises. And some of these people were people who had a connection with it and who meant well. But the Rebbe took a very, a very strong line and, you know, I know some of you might be thinking, you know, Lubavitch is so progressive and so open-minded and so happy. I had a gentleman here uh, yesterday, you know, and he said, oh, he got, you know, he says, I, I, I can, I, not, he's not, I'm not fully from, he said, I can fully identify with Chabad and I'm, he's looking to get married to one of Chabad girl who's open-minded and will work, will grow with me. He says, you know, in the Litvak community that I, that I, I see over where I am, they're, they don't smile much, and they're too tough. I can't relate to it. So the word on the street is, you want to you, you want to feel good? Go to Chabad. You know, they make you feel good. Which is true. Which is true. But but it's 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 a feel good based on Torah. And if there's a breach in Torah in any way, shape, or form, there's no room for that feel good. Now, the difference is Chabad's not going to say you're a sinner and you're bad. You know, that's not the approach. 
but the Rebbe was so strict and really, in a way, you could say like narrow-minded, you know what I mean? Old shtetl. He didn't make, he didn't accept any compromises. And you could be the biggest chassid and give the most amount of money to his charities, to his institutions. It didn't fathom him, fathom him an iota because he was an ish emes and an ish Torah. So the third topic, which is relevant to us, is that little compromise. Now, to balance the difference between a fanaticism and a compromise requires a lot of seichel. This is where the das, the chabad, the das, the das of chabad, Avi, is so important. How to balance and, you know, on one hand, not to make a compromise and to be, and not to allow the wall to be breached at all. And at the same time, to make room for a situation that warrants a situation. And I believe if we, if we, you know, understand the issue and we think about the issue and we consult with someone else about the issue, it could be your own spouse, it could be, you know, a, a friend, a mashpia, a rabbi, whoever it is, then you, usually you'll find a, a method that is not compromising, yet not being fanatical where you hurt another person or you hurt yourself. You know, there were students in yeshiva who had great minds and great memories and they decided they want to learn all of Shas. I knew one such student. He like could repeat, he had a photographic memory and he decided to join the Kloisenberger Rebbe, right? Rabbi Kusil Halberstam of blessed memory. He started a program called Mifal Hashas, which is to learn Shas either in a year or three years. I, no, I think maybe two, three years. To do that, you had to learn pretty much most hours of the day Gemara, you know? And this fellow, decided to do it, and Nebuch, he had a breakdown, a nervous breakdown, and he wasn't the same ever since. He read his Neil Mammoth, let him have a lift, and he got an aid. You know, there, there are sometimes, for the sake of not compromise, we hurt ourselves. We hurt others for sure. But the question is, so how do you balance? How do you balance the two? And the answer is, if, if you plugged in and, and, and you follow Taita and you talk it with someone else, advice, advice from a yoetz, I don't mean a yoetz, you know, a friend, a uh, counselor, uh, it can go a long way because we are subjective. And to find the objective truth and approach gets muddy, murky. So, so when you share it with someone else and you hear how they respond to it, it can be a very good way for you to see a balanced approach. But again, this does not mean to say that allow the compromise. See, there's a difference between I'm going to make the compromise or I'm not going to stop something or someone for making a compromise if they need that. Because people have weaknesses, we all do. And we're well intended, we, we, we you know, intentioned, we, we, we mean well, but sometimes we don't have the koyach. We don't, we don't have, we're just not there. So there's a difference. I'll give you an example. The Rebbe, like many other tzaddikim and rabbonim, Rosh Hashiva, didn't appreciate when you took pictures of them. In Europe, that was the biggest, like, taboo is taking pictures. You know that, right? That's why in the Chofetz Chaim picture, you see he's walking with his head down. And I think at one point, if you look at the video, you see it goes like this. If you take a look at the video, it's online. They have, you know, the movie, he's, like, covering up his face because he saw a camera uh, or something pointing at him. The overall attitude of, your, of the European, the Rabbonim, etc., was not to allow pictures. No, 
America is all about pictures, pictures and fame and glory. That's, that's the culture, especially today. I mean, the, come on. And look, we're benefiting from seeing each other. So there's so much, my, such, so many advantages to learn Taita with pictures and, and videos and sound and all that. So I recall that there were times when for to take pictures of the Rebbe and he didn't stop them. But it doesn't mean to say that he enjoyed it, okay? There's a difference between not stopping someone and, 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 and uh, allowing them to do their thing for whatever reason, and yet you yourself would not initiate it. So maybe that's a, a, a practical answer to the balancing of not making compromises and a very rigid you know, view. But this is an ongoing thing. So I conclude with the following. This attitude of, of seeing that the three weeks, on one hand, we need to really make the wall stronger, take a look at where in the wall there might be cracks and make the wall stronger. And at the same time, understand that the purpose of the wall is for us to grow and come out healthier. And that is the message. So the purpose of mourning, you hear this, is to come out stronger. If the purpose of mourning leads you to more depression, more melancholy, more angry, anger, and more, um, you know, more, more upsetness and, and all that, then you have to stop the mourning. Then your mourning is not a justified mourning. So yes, we're mourning these three weeks. And yes, the base on Migdash was destroyed. The Mitzvah Shem, it won't be this year, it'll be rebuilt. The purpose of the morning is to make us starker, stronger. And that's and 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 the way you do it is by not allowing a breach in the wall. That was this is the overall uh idea that the Rebbe presented several times on Shiva Subatamas that I think is um a way to deal with other issues in our life, you know, when God forbid someone loses someone in their life or when someone goes through a hardship, you know, there's, it's not just about losing a loved one, but even going through um, losing a job, you know, uh, whatever, it, you know, there, there are reasons when we get very shook up, you know? So this is, this oh, three week period is the focal time to give us the koyach to deal with these issues. And again, the objective is Moshe to become stronger, not weaker. Okay, my friends, we're going to start a new mimer. I'll let you know which mimer. I'll take a look. I, um, and um, Sunday, Zaygazund, have an easy fast, and only at Slok and yeah. Okay, thank you. programs, holidays.